Welcome to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio, bringing you insights and strategies to help you create a magnificent and fulfilling second half of life. Here's your host, certified professional retirement coach and best-selling author, Dr. Dorian Mincer. I want to welcome everyone today to my Revolutionize Your Retirement Fourth Tuesday program. The program is called Revolutionize Your Retirement Interview with Expert Series to help you create a fulfilling second half of life. I am delighted that you're all here, and I'm delighted that we have today David Chernikoff, who will be our guest. David is a meditation teacher, spiritual counselor, and life coach who taught psychology and meditation at Naropa University for many years. In the early 1980s, he worked at Ram Dass's Hanuman Foundation Dying Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then he became the director of Mesilla Valley Hospice in Las Cruces, New Hampshire. He later spent three years in Nepal doing public health development work for the Seva Foundation and studying with Tibetan Buddhist teachers. After returning to the United States, he became the education and training director for the Spiritual Eldering Institute, which is now called Saging International. In that role, he taught conscious aging programs throughout the United States, in Canada, and in Ireland. He's currently one of the guiding teachers of the Insight Meditation Community of Colorado and has a private practice in Boulder. He's the author of this new book that we'll be talking about today, Life Part Two, Seven Keys to Awakening with Purpose and Joy as You Age. And I'm so delighted that David's our guest. I must say, I both listened to the book, and then I also, I don't know, I guess I always will be a somebody who loves to hold books, <laughs> because I also can go back and refer back to poetry and the comments and all of that. And it's such a rich book, so I recommend it to everybody. I think it should be really a must-have book on your shelf or that you listen to or on your Kindle to deal with kind of life in the second half of life. So, David, welcome. And Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. So why don't I always like to start with why, what inspired you to write the book and why this book? Maybe we can start with that. Sure. There were several different reasons I wrote the book. One of them was that I, a few years back I was approaching age 70, and I had the thought that when I turned 71, that would be an anniversary of a sort, marking the fact that it would be 50 years since I first was introduced to spiritual teachings and meditation practices. And I was really um, interested in doing a certain kind of life review and a reflection upon what I had learned in those 50 years about myself and about life. And I wondered if I could articulate that and share it in a way that might be helpful to other people. So that was part of the motivation. And as a result of that reflection on my life and that life review process that I took myself through, I realized how much incredible gratitude I feel for the teachers I had the good fortune to study and practice with and how much my life had been enriched by what they had offered to me. And I felt that one of the best ways to express that gratitude was to pass along what they had taught, to pay it forward, in effect. So those were two important reasons that I wrote the book. And the third one had to do with the work that I've done over the last 25 or 30 years in the field of conscious aging since I read, read, met Reb Zalman back in the 1990s. And that has to do with the realization that there's an, it seems to me there's an enormous amount of unnecessary suffering that people in our modern Western culture experience in relation to aging because of confused views and attitudes that are really, in my mind, out of alignment with reality. And there are these beliefs that the culture perpetuate because we do tend to be somewhat youth-obsessed in the culture that the process of becoming an older human being is some kind of descent and a downhill movement in terms of quality of life. And while I'm not naive about the fact that there are challenges 
built into the aging process, some of which are quite difficult. It's also true that in indigenous cultures around the world, for example, the last third of life is considered to be the fruitional phase of one's life. And in many ways can be a very rich and satisfying process of life completion. And I thought that if I could contribute to creating a more sane and healthy and wise paradigm for the aging process in our culture, perhaps some of that unnecessary suffering associated with confused beliefs about the reality of aging. Maybe I could help out a little bit in that regard. I must say I'm certainly glad you were inspired to to do the writing because I think you accomplished your goal. At least I feel that way. I think that, that there's such a wonderful unfolding that you have in it. And you're absolutely right. There's so much ageism and internalized ageism in our particular culture. And I think that it does a disservice to all of us. And I know you just mentioned in indigenous cultures, people, the last third of life, people are valued. This book, you talk about the second half of life, but that it has two different kind of meanings. Can you just talk a little about what you mean by second half of life and the different meanings that you have and why do you think it's important? I certainly could. Some people will recognize that phrase, the second half of life, as one that Carl Jung, the great transpersonal psychologist talked about, and, and most people associate that phrase with chronological age. So Jung and various other people in the world of psychology and philosophy have talked about the stages of life and the lifespan process and the way in which we go through a midlife transition at a certain point, and then we move into uh, a later point in our experience. And essentially, primarily, I wrote the book with an emphasis on the chronological dimension of the second half of life in terms of the numbers of years that we've lived. However, in my work over the years as a psychotherapist, as a spiritual counselor, as a meditation teacher and a hospice director, I noticed that there's another way in which that phrase, the second half of life, could be understood. And that relates to some of the profound life transitions that we all inevitably go through at certain times. For example, I tell a story in the book about a man in his late 20s who I worked with over a three-year period. He was a really brilliant man and was in a PhD program, finishing up a PhD degree in psychology. And sadly, he was in a motor vehicle accident that left him with a serious head injury. And overnight, in one accident, this man went from being someone whose primary distinguishing feature in life was his brilliant intellect and his gifts on that level to someone who was unable to read and who had trouble with word finding and other cognitive deficits that changed his life entirely. And it was a kind of experience where it divided his life in half on the experiential level in terms of the subjectivity of his life. He felt like the life he had known had ended and he was now in a whole new world that he really didn't know how to navigate because he was going to be participating in what turned out to be a several year recovery process of cognitive therapy, treatment, psychotherapy for depression and anxiety and a number of other changes that he hadn't anticipated when he got in his car that morning. And even though he was in his late 20s, here he was really feeling like he was starting his life anew. I remember literally I had a different client in life coaching say something to me about that kind of second half of life where he also was a fairly young person in his 30s and went through a major life transition. And in that case, he said to me, this doesn't even feel like a new chapter in my life. It feels like mm -hmm. book two. So part of what I wanted to do in this book was also write something that would speak to people of any age who go through a major life transition in which their whole sense of self is radically changed. And it feels as if they're almost a different person living a different life. And that's the second meaning that I'm referring to mm -hmm. when I use that phrase in the book. 
And I think it's such an important one. And you're absolutely right. I know reading that part about the younger person with that accident and just thinking about the parallels, you know, that as we get older, when there's not something as kind of life-changing in a nanosecond, but just with our identity has been as a parent or if our den- as an active parent with young children or if our identity has been work, it is like this sense of, who am I now? I mean, that's what we constantly are Absolutely. talking about. And, yeah. and your book just so richly describes it, which, which leads to, so how did you decide on the seven essential elements of conscious living and conscious aging? I think that will maybe get us to, to looking at some of these issues of how, how we gra- grapple with this as we get older. But as you're absolutely right, it could be at any age that somebody's confronted with this. That's an interesting question, how I came up with those seven keys, as I called them. And there were a couple of steps in that process. The first one was the life review process and the reminiscence that I did on the years of my life as I was approaching 70 a few years ago. And I just tried to understand my own spiritual journey and my own life as it had unfolded to date and to make sense of it, in effect, because as we oftentimes can make a lot more sense of our lives when we're looking back at them than, we're, than when we're looking forward at the unknown. And so first I identified those as stages or steps in my own experience of unfolding and growing and learning over the years. And then I spent a significant amount of time reflect, reflecting upon the work I had done with other people in the various people-helping roles I had been in over several decades. And I saw the parallels between my experience and the experience of other people. And I was put in touch with one of the things that fascinates me about our human experiences, which is that there's simultaneously a uniqueness to every person's experience that's absolutely, completely unique to the individual. And at the very same time, there are universals that occur as well. So uh, in my case, for example, uh, my father died suddenly from a heart attack unexpectedly when I was 13 years old. And that was a really formative event in my life that, among other things, led me to start asking questions at 13 that most people don't find interesting until they're 55 or 60. And I was introduced to grief in a way that I had never known existed before my father's death. Now, absolutely every human being who is born will come to know grief at one time or another. And so on one level, my grief was unique to the circumstances of my father's death. And at the very same moment, I saw that because I had that experience, I felt a particular resonance when I sat with and talked to other people and they shared their grief with me. I could empathize in a way that was more than intellectual. I could meet them there when they talked about how forlorn they felt or the despair they felt or the depth of their sadness and so forth. Right? And I started to see that the same seven keys that I noticed in my life appeared to be quite relevant in relation to the lives of many people that I had known and worked with. And in my case, I've had the good fortune of living in Boulder, Colorado for many years now and working with people in a variety of roles as a spiritual teacher, as a psychotherapist, as a teacher at Naropa University in the graduate school of transpersonal psychology. So I have people that I've been working with over 25 and 30 year periods. And I have seen these same seven keys that really relevant and useful signposts in other people's lives as well. They all do seem, I'm just going to mention them for people who maybe haven't had a chance to read the book, and I'd like to explore bits of some of them with you. But the seven, if it's okay with you to mention, are embracing the mystery, choosing a vision, Awakening intuition, committing to inner work, suffering effectively, serving from the heart, and celebrating the journey. 
And I just, again, want to comment after having listened to and also read the book that there's such richness in it and from the people that you've learned from because you integrate that into each chapter. And you've just just mentioned about the impact of when you were 13 and your father died, which kind of has its the profound impact. And I was so impressed with that chapter, too, of just you could elaborate a bit about the embracing the mystery because you know when you think about it there's so much mystery and sense of unfairness in the world at different stages and and i think you beautifully give examples of both the impact of death both your fathers and then you've worked so much with people in the dying process and dying stage but also of birth so can you maybe elaborate a little about what you mean by embracing the mystery yes the reason i said that experience with my father's death was so formative and important in my experience is in part because it put me in touch with the centrality of mystery in a spiritually oriented life. And as you may recall, I shared the story in the book about a visit from the rabbi from our synagogue when he came to console me after my father's death. I grew up in the Jewish tradition, and we weren't super traditional in that sense. It was a reformed Jewish synagogue, and yet it was an important part of our extended family life. And my grandparents in particular were, they had seven children, of which my father was one. And the meaning of family and the liturgical calendar of the Jewish year was important for us and things like that. And this rabbi who was a very wonderful person, came over to our house. My mother had arranged this without even consulting me, which I wasn't so thrilled about. But we sat down together, and I was angry and confused and shocked, traumatized, really, since I didn't even think of my father as being ill, that it was difficult for me to express my feelings. I was also a kind of an athletic young male who was taught by the culture in some regard that emotions were more or less a nuisance that got in the way of your athletic performance, basically. So I sat down with the rabbi, and he asked me how I was doing. And I said, okay, and just looked down at my hands and didn't know what to say next and felt awkward. And then I looked up at him, as I talked about in the book, and I said, why my father? He was such a good man, right? And there's that quality of unfairness that you were talking about. And I remember thinking to myself, there's all these rotten people out there who are mean and do terrible things who, if anyone should die, they should. Why my father? And I asked the rabbi, why my dad? And he looked at me and he said, David, son, there are some things that God does that we just don't understand. And I thought that was a terrible answer. It was the last thing I wanted to hear. And at the same time, I didn't realize till years later that the rabbi had planted a seed in my consciousness in relation to the role of mystery. Because as I got older, I started to see that there was a lot about life that I couldn't fully understand. Even though I had a reasonable intellect and it worked pretty well, There were all kinds of aspects of life that seemed unfair or didn't make sense or I couldn't wrestle to the ground with my intellect. And then it came home to me, as I said in the book also, 20 years later, here I am in Las Cruces directing a hospice program. And I visited with a woman whose husband was dying from cancer. And as we left her husband, he fell asleep as the three of us, after the three of us were talking. And we walked out into the hall and I said I'd walk her to her car. And she turned to me. Right? And she said, why my Harvey? And then she literally said, there's all these rotten people out there who deserve to die. Why my Harvey? And I heard myself paraphrasing the rabbi in almost the exact same words, except for the fact that she was a humanist who didn't like what she called silly God talk, unquote. So I said to her, all I can say is there are some things that go on in the universe that we just don't understand. And that showed up in my work with people. 
as well. Other people would say to me, why my child or my partner or life didn't seem fair. It didn't make sense a lot of the time. And we are often asked to embrace aspects of life that we wish weren't what they are and that we can't make sense of rationally. And when you look at the great wisdom traditions, we see that mystery shows up in virtually all of them. My friend and mentor, Father Thomas Keating, for example, when he would come to these conferences we would have at Naropa University in the early 80s, which were called Buddhist Christian Dialogue Conferences, we'd gather together a group of monastics and very committed practitioners who were respected in their various religious and spiritual traditions, and we'd give them a theme or a topic to discuss, and we'd create a fishbowl around them. So we'd have maybe six or eight of these committed spiritual teachers and practitioners talking in the center of the room and a couple, two, three hundred people around, basically with their permission, eavesdropping on the conversation and then opening it up with a Q&A, a, mic, a microphone available for people to come up and ask questions at the end. And Father Thomas, who was just a, a wonderful teacher and very kind and loving man, knew that in a Buddhist gathering, the word God, we're talking about the divine, was a little bit complex and complicated because a lot of people there in Buddhist training or other schools of thought didn't work with the vocabulary of a theistic religious tradition. At the same time, the word God was absolutely central in Father Thomas's life and had been since he was a 21-year-old when he became a monk. So whenever he wanted to talk about God, he would substitute the phrase, the ultimate mystery. <laughs> and interestingly, everybody in that room felt fine about that. And Boulder, being Boulder, Colorado, there were Wiccans and Sufis and atheists and Christians and Jewish people and Buddhist people and Taoist people. It was a real spiritual melting pot. But nobody had a problem with the phrase, the ultimate mystery. And so that's just a, one more finger pointing in the direction of how important mystery is in a consciously lived life. It's so important. And there's so many, there's such richness that you elaborate in. And I think when I just think about what's going on in our world today, in a sense, there's so much of not knowing and just needing to deal with uncertainty and ambiguity. So I guess it's a really big issue of learning how to deal with all different kind of levels and layers of mystery. Oh, very what much else? so. Yeah. One, one, one of the discoveries I've made in my work with people over the years has to do with the, trying to understand you know, what are the characteristics of people who have developed significant spiritual maturity. Mm. And I would say one of the yardsticks that I've noticed consistently with people who have really committed deeply to some kind of authentic spiritual path is that they seem to have a remarkable ability to embrace paradox and contradiction. And th they can sit with it and accept it and not rail against it and pit one side against the other. But rather, they're able to maintain a certain equanimity without spiritually bypassing the emotions and feelings that go with their humanity. And they recognize that sometimes paradox and contradiction is simply an accurate representation of reality, even if the rational mind is uncomfortable with it and unable to apprehend it. So your point about the state of the world right now, in, in many ways, we could argue in one of two directions, right? There have, since the dawn of human history, there have been difficulties and problems on planet Earth. Whether we talk about Genghis Khan or the Crusades or World War I or God knows how many other difficulties and problems that we've had as human beings trying to live together on the planet. So we could easily make a case for the biblical teaching that says there's nothing new under the sun, as it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Right? At the same time, it's very clear to all of us that there's something absolutely unique about the fact that 
we are in a state on this planet right now where the very survival of humanity is called into question. And the breathability of our air and the amount of water that we're going to have to share with a growing number of people on the planet and the nuclear weapons that we live with and the world leaders who are not able to collaborate very effectively and so forth. It's a completely unique time on one level. And that's just one example that comes to mind of this kind of paradox. Yes, it's a unique time, unlike any other. And at the same time, what in Buddhism are called the three poisons, greed, aggression, and delusion, are still creating the same kinds of problems on the planet that they did many centuries ago. Mm. That is, it's so right and so sobering at the same time. And I think it it leads in some respect. I know in that final chapter, Celebrating the Journey, you elaborate on that, and we'll get to that part. But just in terms Mm -hmm. of the more immediate, how, given what you're saying, it is an existential crisis that we're all facing, both about getting older, but also about the world. And so I think the choosing a vision kind of is an interesting, but nice segue into the second chapter of your book, which is Choosing a Vision. Can you just talk a little about what you mean? And Because it's in a way how to help ourselves in that transition through and making sense mm-hmm. of sometimes things that are very hard to make sense of. The idea behind Choosing a Vision um, is in part related to what Western psychology calls reframing or cognitive reframing. Okay. And the principle, as I think, that comes into play is that There are objective events in the world, and then there are the way we interpret them or relate to them. So on one level, we could look at our current situation as something that is hopeless and helpless and that generates despair or cynicism. And it wouldn't be hard to make a case for those feelings being an accurate interpretation of the dire straits that we're living in right now. At the same time, we could look at the very same situation in terms of the fact that it represents some amazing opportunities for people who are interested in spiritual growth and development. Because spiritual growth and development partly involves learning how to be an instrument of benefit in the world and to actualize our best human qualities, qualities like wisdom, compassion, generosity, kindness, and so forth. And for people who are interested in cultivating those qualities, whether we talk about that in terms of enlightenment or awakening or simply becoming a good human being or developing what the Dalai Lama calls a good heart and becoming what he calls a force for good, If that's what my vision is of my life, the raw material available to work with right now is unprecedented. And so if if my vision is to be like St. Francis, Lord, make me an instrument of thy will. Or Mother Teresa, when asked by a reporter how she did all the amazing things that she helped bring into being and all the wonderful work that she did, she said, I'm simply a pencil in the hand of God. I don't take credit for any of it. That represents, those kinds of statements represent a vision of how these people understand their lives. And almost all of the great wisdom traditions, although they use different vocabularies and different language, include in their vision that the experiences we have as human beings, we can choose to see as a curriculum for the process of spiritual awakening. And once we make that choice, that creates a perceptual shift in which we actually start to experience what happens in our lives as a curriculum, as a training program, as an opportunity to cultivate the best of our human qualities. And so while we don't have any illusion of control over a lot of the outside events in our lives and what goes on in the world, we do want to recognize that we have a tremendous power to make choices 
about how we interpret and frame those events and our relationship to them. And that's really the underpinning of that chapter on choosing a vision and why I think it's so important. Because once I understand that mystery plays a central role in life, then the question becomes, how will I relate to that mystery? Will I relate to from a place of fear and anxiety or resistance and resentment? Or will I relate to it as an incredible adventure that I had the good fortune to be able to explore for whatever limited amount of time I'm here on earth? And my experience is it's really, it's much more life affirming to choose to see our lives as a curriculum for awakening mm -hmm. rather than some kind of punishment from a punishing God or some kind of destiny that we have no control over and are helpless in relation to. That's a very, those are disempowering perspectives that undermine our joie de vivre and our connection to the joy that's potential in life, even when the world's in the state that it's currently in. Oh, I think that is so important. And just even asking, as you say in the book, too, what sort of a simple question of what matters the most to me and to what extent is it part of my life or what do I need to do to help to move with that vision and move in that direction. Yeah. Comment, and then I want to keep moving onward, but you comment about the use of phrases to help us sustain a vision, and I like that part, the use of pithy phrases. Can you just, just comment on that? Because you, know, you, you talk about it as a reset button, and I like that idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Articulating a vision can be a, a complex process of a sort yeah. um, that takes a certain amount of inner work and investigation and commitment, and yet once, the, once there is a vision that we've been able to articulate and understand our lives in relation to, then the major challenge is how do we remember to stay connected to it and not constantly fall off track or miss our exit on the freeway and go too many exits past being the person we want to be. Because we all have what, what Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Buddhist teacher, calls wholesome seeds and unwholesome seeds in, in each of us, right? Seeds of love and compassion and wisdom and joy and generosity and so forth, and seeds of greed and delusion and resentment and anger and, and hatred in some cases, right? And so then the question becomes, how do we water the wholesome seeds in such a way that the unwholesome seeds eventually atrophy and are no longer a part of our character that influence our behavior so much? And so these phrases are like short reminders that bring us back to our vision when someone really presses our buttons or something, or we act mm -hmm. out impulsively and say or do something that we later regret and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I gave a few examples in there that have been really helpful to me. One of them had to do with a story that Ram Dass told years ago in which he, he in the 60s, late 60s, he was in India studying with his teacher and in more or less in solitude doing intense yoga and meditation practices and keeping silence. But then he had something come up in his family life and had got called back to Massachusetts, right? But after a, an extended period of living quite simply and being away from what he felt was the madness of modern Western life in the United States, Ramdas was really quite frightened of what would happen to him when he went back to the intensity of the United States. So he went to his teacher, a man named Neem Karoli Baba, who his the students often called simply Maharaji, and he said to him, I have to go back to the States, and in effect, I'm afraid I'm going to be eaten alive. Is there something that you can offer me or help me with so I can remember who I am when, when I'm over there, and I can remember what I've learned here that's been so profound? And his teacher gave him three simple instructions, and those were love everyone, serve everyone, and remember God. And I first heard that story probably in about the mid-70s, I'd say, mid to late 70s. 
And from the time I heard it, it became one of those touch points that was like a reset button when I lost my temper or when I felt really upset about something or confused about something or saw myself act inappropriately and was lost in self-criticism, which I had a talent for many years. I would just hear that phrase come up, love everyone, which included me, I had to remind myself, serve everyone and remember God. And when I was initially in, in spiritual life, I was really involved with the word God. I started out as a yoga teacher in my early 20s. And it, it just, it, it was a reset. It would bring me back into feeling in touch with that vision of my life as a curriculum, not an exercise in perfectionism, and that I would make mistakes because I'm human, but I could learn from them and I could grow from them and not repeat the same mistakes in the future. So that's just one example that comes to mind. Yeah. But as you saw in the book, there were a few other phrases, yeah. like short teachings like that, that I sometimes call tattooables, you know. Tattooables, um, I like that. Yeah. yeah. If I were somebody who liked tattooing my body, which I'm not, I, would, I could put a phrase like, love everyone, serve everyone, remember God, on the inside of my left forearm, so it would be readily available. Mm -hmm in those difficult moments. Right. Yeah, that's great. And just to remind everybody, the book is called Life Part Two, and it's available on, on Amazon. And just remember, to submit some questions, and you might have a chance of winning a copy of it today. So you talk about w awakening intuition in your book. And may, I think it would be helpful for our listeners if you could define what is intuition to you and what do you mean by that and yeah, let's just go with that to start with yeah intuition can be defined in a lot of different ways i included it in the book because i think it plays a really important role in in many spiritual traditions i think of it as a way of knowing that includes in some cases rationality but is not limited to the rational mind there's a famous statement that albert einstein made at one point where he said and uh, I did not discover the fundamental laws of the universe with my rational mind. So what do we then mean by intuition? It's a way of knowing ourselves and the world that involves what sometimes is called a felt shift. Oftentimes it involves the physical body. Oftentimes it involves being in touch with the emotions associated with a certain decision I'm trying to make, for example. and it's a sense of knowing that comes from a quiet mind. For example, in the research on intuition, meditation training has been found to be one of the causes and conditions that supports the development of this deeper kind of knowing than just the rational mind. Because the rational mind, as one of my teachers put it at one point, is a great servant but a lousy master. And we've grown up if we grew up in the United States in a culture that in many ways, at least when I was being schooled, put the rational mind on a pedestal and largely disregarded any other form of knowing that wasn't in alignment with something like the scientific method. I have great appreciation for the scientific method. However, I also think it has limits and there are deeper aspects to reality that it cannot apprehend. So and intuition involved, if I'm sitting with a client, I'll hear a client say something like, I decided to take the job in L.A. instead of the job in Boston, even though the job in L.A. had a higher salary. Right? It just felt right to take the job and work with these other people. Right? Or I'll sit with someone who's contemplating the difficulties in their marriage when I was still doing psychotherapy and couples counseling and such. And someone will say to me, my heart tells me that it's time to work with these difficulties, not time to lead this marriage. Or the opposite. My heart says that I've done everything I can to work out this partnership and it's really time for me to make a change and move on. And so people will refer to their bodies oftentimes the heart or the gut. I had a gut feeling, for example, people will say. And 
And those are reflections of a more whole mind-body knowing than just that which is above the neck. Mm -hmm. When it comes to spiritual development, this kind of deeper knowing is extremely important from my perspective. How, so it leads me to just wonder, how does one differ between intuition and self-deception? I know you talk about that a little in the book, and I wonder if you could comment on that. How do we really trust that knowing versus that we're deceiving ourselves? Yeah, that, that's one of the big challenges that comes into play because my sense is that that intuition is one of the most amazing of our human capacities, actually. It's just extraordinary to me what it can do. And the only other human capacity that's equally amazing to me <laughs> is our capacity for self-deception, which is also quite wondrous if you look at how seduced we can be into believing the projections of our mind or hoping that what we want will become what is reality. Yeah. So I, as in the book, I have a whole set of guidelines for how to discern actual intuition and intuitive wisdom from what can be self-deception in many cases. Part of it has to do with the intention when we're trying to make a choice. If there's a really wholesome intention, particularly if it's altruistic and of benefit to other living beings or the earth, right? there's a much better chance that we're tapping into our intuition than our ego needs and our self-preservation needs and all of what evolutionary biology provided us with to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's also helpful to use our rationality to ask ourselves if it seems like a reasonable decision or makes sense in view of the data or the facts involved, but not solely just use that reason, right? We can also talk to people we know and respect who we see as wise people, whether that's our best friend or our spouse or our therapist or spiritual teacher or people in a a men's group or a 12-step group or a women's group people who've known us for a long time, we can run it by other people and get some feedback. And that can be very helpful. There's a few other things that that I could talk about, but I don't know how much depth you want me to go into because I know we've got a limited amount of time. No, I think that's good. And my hope is that as people listen, they'll decide that this is really a wonderful book to to listen to or buy, Audible or the actual book. Yeah, I want to move on just because there's so many other parts that I'd love you to just expand on a little. I know in chapter five, it's called suffering effectively. And it's such an unusual phrase. So could you explain what you mean by suffering effectively? Yeah. (laughs) I I first heard that phrase in a story that a meditation teacher told at a retreat about Thomas Merton, the great Christian contemplative, who after being a bohemian for many years, decided to make a radical turnabout and become a Trappist monk. And his friends were all so shocked by his decision to do that, they just could not make any sense of it whatsoever. They, One of them said to him, why would you become a Trappist monk, especially in the order of Cistercians, which is one of the strictest and most ascetic of the orders in the Catholic Church, why in the world would you do that? I mean, aren't you going to suffer a lot from all that asceticism? And Merton said to him, I didn't become a Trappist monk so that I would suffer more than other people. I became a Trappist monk so that I could learn to suffer more effectively. And I first heard that phrase and I was totally put off by it until I started to hear other teachers echoing that sentiment and talking about a similar concept. And what it boils down to is that for those of us who are really committed to a spiritually oriented lifestyle, there's a point at which uh, we come to see that our own suffering from a spiritual standpoint is functional. It's not desirable. We wouldn't wish it upon ourselves or anybody else. However, as we all have lived enough life to know, it's inevitable that we'll experience suffering. 
And then the question is, as I talked about earlier, how are we going to frame it or how are we going to work with it? And what we see is that from the standpoint of awakening, our own suffering can become a gateway to compassion. Just in the way I talked about in relation to my father's death. It was not an accident that 20 years after he died, I was directing hospice programs and teaching people how to grieve, right? That seed had come to fruition, and I felt a particular sensitivity to people who were grieving, right? And in that way, instead of our suffering being meaningless and pointless, there's a way in which we understand that the suffering that we experience can be understood to be part of the curriculum of a spiritually oriented life. And in that sense, we learn a practice that Tibetans call turning poison into medicine. You look at someone like Elie Wiesel, who survived the Holocaust, and what a brilliant life he went on to live, and what an important voice and figure he became. I wouldn't have wished that suffering on him or anyone else, and yet look at what he did with it. So that's what I mean by effective suffering, that is recognizing that when our suffering arises and we're visited by that kind of experience, we can see it as something to grow through and learn from that can deepen our connection to other human beings and other living beings. That's so important. could go on and talk about these things with you for hours, but I want to move along for the sake of mm-hmm. the time that we have. But it's a great segue, actually, into your next chapter, which is serving from the heart, because you're talking about this, thinking about nobody wants to have to suffer, but that the suffering effectively can lead to this transformation, this growth through the transition. And I think that gets into the chapter six, which is serving from the heart. You talk about how service plays such an important role in many spiritual traditions. Can you help all of us understand why you think that's the case? Yeah, I think it's a natural outgrowth of what we were just talking about, right? Because if I become a more compassionate human being, I literally, quote, feel moved to alleviate the suffering that I bear witness to. And I don't necessarily do the, I don't offer my acts of service because I should or because I ought to in that regard. It's not something that comes down from on high as an ethical teaching, although that's helpful sometimes. It's more like a natural expression, right? Because Mm -hmm. as we deepen our spiritual practice, we come to experience in a profound way how completely interconnected we all are. That on one level, we're like one body. That's what the notion of the cosmic Christ is, the body of Christ. Why would the left hand not help the right hand if it were hurting? Or we come to see ourselves, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, like waves that are all a part of the same ocean. And we might pop up and one wave talk to another wave and feel very individual. And yet we want to remember that we're part of the same ocean of this ultimate mystery that we're privileged to experience. And when we bear witness to suffering, we feel moved to alleviate it. And then we have to assess our circumstance with our intuition and see in what way we might be someone who could help out. And it becomes a kind of natural impulse rather than a should or not. It's a beautiful way of putting it, of just how it flows. It's an outgrowth of that understanding and the compassion for self and other. It's just, I think you talk about it and write about it lovely, which leads us to chapter seven, which is celebrating the journey. And can you speak a little about that? My, well, part of what I really like in that chapter too, is that you, you have a, a slightly different understanding of happiness, that you view happiness in a couple of different ways. And I wonder if you could speak about that. Yes. I think one of the most important life lessons I've learned, and this really came to realization in the process of writing the book, was that I had spent most of my life into midlife 
with a certain understanding of happiness I'd been given by the culture. And that had to do with the way in which happiness is associated with pleasure. And that's one kind of happiness for sure, right? However, the way we use the word in our culture generally suggests that happiness is an emotional state. For example, if I get what I want, if I apply for a job and I get shortlisted and it's my ideal job and I'm offered the job, I'm thrilled. On the other hand, if I'm on a short list with two other people and I come in second, I'm very unhappy and disappointed. Yeah. That's one kind of happiness. It's an emotional state. Or um, if I go to a restaurant with one of my favorite people and we have some of my favorite food, and the, our hearts are open and we feel very connected and our friendship or our love or our romance is shining brightly, I'm really happy. Yeah. At the same time, if I'm eating that favorite piece of grilled salmon and a fishbone gets lodged in my jaw, my happiness disappears very quickly. Yeah. So the point here is that most of us in our culture think of happiness as something that is the result of external causes and conditions. And what I'm saying, and I call that in the book, conventional happiness. And I contrast it to what in the book I call contemplative happiness, which is a different kind of happiness and well-being that in, in Christian teachings is called the peace that surpasses understanding. It's that equanimity that I talked about earlier when I said that spiritually mature people that I've met over the years seem to be able to maintain a quality of equanimity even when another part of their being is experiencing a variety of emotions that can be quite upsetting. It's almost, in Zen tradition, they, they call it grandmother mind. It's as if one part of us is like the grandchild and is going through all the ups and downs and in-between so of being human and owning our humanness and vulnerability. And another part of us is like this ideal loving grandmother who's just thrilled that the grandchild exists at all and is able to know that it's all going to work out in the end somehow <laughs> and is able to be present with all of the ups and downs and in-betweens that grandchild goes through. And that's a different kind of happiness that sometimes mm. in the teachings, in Buddhist teachings, it's called enduring happiness. Yeah, or sometimes it's called well-being. And what's different is that it's a state of being rooted in awareness itself. So rather than being dependent on external conditions, which are always changing, it's more as if this enduring happiness is our deeper nature, what Buddhism calls Buddha nature or some contemplative Christians call Christ consciousness, or transpersonal psychology calls our true self, our true nature. And this kind of contemplative happiness is one of the primary qualities of our deeper nature. And it's not vulnerable to external conditions the way conventional happiness is. That's a wonderful explanation of it. But you mentioned earlier, but I think it ties into this celebrating the journey and this idea of this more enduring or abiding happiness that you talk about. Expand a little about embracing the paradox, because I do think that celebrating this journey and dealing with becoming this wise elder that you know, hopefully many of us are on that journey. We have to, as we talked about earlier, embrace the paradoxes of life, the uncertainty, the ambiguities and all. And you have a lovely way of dealing with that. So could you share that to our list, with our listeners? I can certainly try. I think one of the ways that, that we become spiritually mature people is by moving from what I call either or thinking, which is associated with the rational mind. The rational mind says either A exists or not A exists, but A and not A can't coexist. And a lot of the times when we're struggling and suffering and in conflict, we're caught up in a kind of either or thinking. Either you love me or you don't, lo you don't like me if you're angry at me and you're my spouse or my, either you love me or you don't love me, right? 
except a lot of us know and have had the experience of sometimes we get angriest at the people we love the most, right? Because we know them in a particular way. And so what seems to be true is that we can move from either or thinking to what I would call both and thinking. I love you and right now I'm very angry at you because of X, Y, Z. Yeah. Likewise, we can look at the world and say the, the world is in a terrible place right now. We could make a case for that. And at the same time, if you look at all of the wonderful things that are going on in the world and all the positive acts of human beings who are helping one another on so many levels from the most ordinary act of taking a next door neighbor to a doctor's appointment to acts on a very large scale in which people are making significant efforts to turn the Titanic of this planet into a more life-affirming direction, there's a both-and quality. In, Ru in Rudyard Kipling's novel, Kim, it's about a street urchin who meets a Tibetan Lama, and the Tibetan Lama is always saying, sighing, when he experiences the life in the city, and he sighs and he says, oh, this great and terrible world. And that's a both and. Ram Dass used to talk about what he called the horrible beauty, which is a similar kind of idea that there's a lot that goes on that's quite horrible and tragic. And just standing in a grocery store line when an infant in a babe in arms is staring at me and smiling, there's that too. Right. So ultimately... <laughs> What we're trying to do is embrace it all with a sense of this is life and say yes. And I call that all of the above thinking, right? So there's this movement from either or to both and then eventually a kind of a reverent bow and saying this is life on planet Earth. It includes what the Chinese call the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrow. Mm -hmm. And we say yes. Yeah. We say yes to the whole package. That's lovely. Yeah. So anything, one other question, which just would be helpful. Let's come from, from Indiana, Sally. says, how, how do you define spirituality? You've been talking mm -hmm. about and around it, but I think that's a question I should raise here since it was... It hasn't been integrated yet. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I don't attach it to any particular religious perspective or any specific spiritual tradition. My way of understanding the word spirituality is that it refers to the level of deepest meaning in our lives. That sounds very important and clear. And another question came, and I think you've actually been talking about it, but let me just, just state it also that you talked at the beginning about how going through a life review led to the develop, of, development of your book. And Michael said he was curious if some things came that you really could act on. And, and I think you've expanded on that, but I just wondered if there was anything else you wanted to add on that. Um, part of how I hear that question is maybe in what way have your learning and your vision led to you creating the life and really discovering what your calling was. Yeah. In a way, the book is an interesting example because I've been an avid reader and a lover of books since I was a toddler and I first looked at picture books. And throughout my life, I found tremendous benefit from what I learned from books. But I'd never really tried to write one, even though I've been teaching for many years. I've, I wrote articles over the years and short pieces for newsletters and magazines and journals and things like that at times. But I realized one of the things I wanted to act on was actually contributing to this world of books that had been such a blessing and a gift in my life. And so my choice to write the book was one example of an action that arose as a result of that life review process. And I thought, my life will feel incomplete. It was a bucket list item, in effect. My life will feel incomplete 
if I don't make an effort to do this at some point, knowing that I didn't know if a publisher would pick it up or what would happen with it at all. But if I didn't give it a go, I would have felt a certain kind of incompleteness when I got to the end of my life. So that's a very concrete action. Yeah. It came as a result of that life review. That's a lovely example of it. And I think we're all grateful that, that you brought it to fruition and it got published and it's available. So tell mm-hmm. people how they can both access the book or website or how to learn more from you. I know you, you teach in many different places, in international mm-hmm. other places. So maybe share that now with people. Sure. The easiest resource would be my website, which is just my name, davidchernikoff.com, and that has on it a schedule of teachings that I'm offering, sometimes in person and sometimes online. It also has an archive of talks that go back about 20 years uh, on a whole variety of different topics that are freely available to anyone who's interested. If that would be of interest, that would be there. Uh, And it has a resource section. It has a resource section with information about some of the meditation communities I teach in and participate in, and also some of the quotations and readings that I use in the talks that I give, some of the quotations people often ask for copies of. So my web person has started to post some of those just to make them available for people who might find them of interest. But that's probably the best resource. I do teach... I teach two online weekly groups that are ongoing. One is on Sunday mornings from 8 to 8.45 Mountain Time, and that's about 25 or 30 minutes of silent sitting meditation followed by a short talk of about 20 minutes or so. And I lead a Tuesday night group in Boulder that is currently online that's gone on for many years and That's from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time, and that includes the first half is a 45-minute silent sitting meditation period and a few announcements, and the second hour is usually a talk from 8 to 9, Mm. either that I give or a guest speaker gives. And I do have an email list that, that people could, if you wanted to be on my email list about announcements and things, you could go to the website and use the contact page and just send me your information and ask me to put your name and email on the email list. So oh, that's those are great. And people can sign. That's wonderful. And people can sign up for some of these things. It's a drop in or sign up or be part of. Yeah. Or, mm-hmm. Two, uh, yeah. Tuesday night and Sunday are drop in. So there's no registration yep. required. You just okay. need to re- sign up so that you receive the link. Of a Zoom, it's a, it, these are Zoom meetings, and the, we send uh-huh. out a Zoom right. link and explain all that. And, yeah, I've got some events coming up. I've got an online retreat coming up September 8th to 11th, sponsored by a group in North Carolina. I've got some other activities coming up as well. Great. Great. If, if anyone who visited with us today would want to join any of those activities. Wonderful. Thank you for letting people know that. Any final kind of takeaways that you'd like listeners to have as we just pull this all together? What comes to mind, it's interesting. A friend of mine gave went to a month-long retreat in California a while back, and when she came back, I asked her how it was. And she said the highlight was a talk one of the teachers gave in which she talked about what she called the six-word dharma. Dharma being a word referring to the body of Buddhist teachings. And my friend said to me, this teacher captured the whole of the spiritual teachings of all the traditions in six words. (laughs) So this is another tattooable for those of you who might want a reset button. And I think if we try to sum up what it is I'm trying to convey in the book, it would involve these six words. And those are pay attention. Don't cling. Be kind. (sighs) Those are wonderful words. There's a homework assignment for anybody who wants a little homework for the rest of your life. (laughs) 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 Uh, Wonderful to add with that. Those are wonderful six words. Pay attention, Mm. don't cling, and be kind. On that note, 
David. It's just been wonderful having you here. And I, as I said, I could go on and on having read your book. And it, there's such wonderful examples and such depth to it to help with these seven keys to, as you say, awaken to purpose and joy as we age. So thank you so much for being here and, and taking the extra time too. And I'm really appreciative and feel a lot of gratitude of sharing this bit of time with you. So thank you so much. And oh, be well you're so you. welcome, Dory. I'm so glad that you invited me and I really enjoyed spending this time with you and with our listeners. Great. Great. Thank you. Take care, everybody, and stay well and safe in these very challenging times still. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Revolutionize Your Retirement Radio with Dr. Dorian Mincer. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show, listen to past episodes, or download our free retirement transition guide, visit revolutionizeyourretirementradio.com.